Good afternoon and welcome to this week's CMC Markets market uh, charting update. Uh, myself, Jasper Lawler, uh, market analyst here. We'll be going through some of the, uh, the major charts of the products that we trade as well as some of the key events for the week. Um, any questions at all, feel free to fire them through into the chat box and then I'll um, address them at the time or, or closer to the end. We'll get through this, this risk warning screen. I'm sure you've all seen this first page. There we are. So this is the 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 morning after the night before, if you like, because we had a, a stellar non-farm payrolls released last week. It was above 300,000, uh, biggest number since 2012. The first above uh, 300k number since January 2012. So. Pretty impressive all round, and it wasn't just that headline number. The, uh, there was wage growth as well, so that's that's been important because that's been something the Federal Reserve, the central bank in the U.S. have been talking about, is that um, wage growth has been a bit slow, um, and so that's been a reason for them not to hike interest rates. And it's these uh, this low interest rate environment for stocks that's been so beneficial and uh, it's the prospect of a higher interest rate that's been causing a, uh, a rally in the US dollar. So if we do just have a quick look at the, uh, the Dow and how things progress there, the Dow was a bit more positive than the S&P, if you, if you read my notes uh, on the US market open. The, um, we can see this is a four hour chart. Um, if we get back to Friday was the fifth. Here was the initial reaction you can't see it so well here. Let me zoom down to a one-hour chart. What kind of happened is that we saw a, a strong kind of initial positive reaction, um, whereby the markets um, did did jump higher, but then initially kind of came. This was like the initial reaction here within the first hour, higher, but then a bit uncertain. Back down to this green line, which you can see kind of perfectly worked to support and has again now, and is what we're retesting. If you're wondering what that is, well, you may have it in your own chart. Simple enough. It's oh, um, just the previous all-time high that was formed there, and that's kind of characterized the top of the range. It's been tested three times for the underside, broke through, completely failed as a, a, as a retest point, but prices stabilized at these short-term moving averages, moved above, little retest there, and down again. So it's been quite a few tests, been quite a pivotal area, this uh, sort of 17, 9, 10 sort of area. And uh, that's what we're bouncing off at the moment. But it wasn't the most immediate euphoric reaction by stocks. But it did eventually follow through. And we came just a whisker away from this um, 18,000 mark, the round number. And we're just pulling away from that round number as people kind of take profits around there. Or indeed, and they, uh, you know, enter some short positions at that, that round figure. Or just ahead of it, rather. So the question really is, um, is that re that really good data theoretically should just be great for stocks, but because of the environment we're in, the great data means that actually potentially what we'll be looking at is a sooner rate hike from the Fed, and it's been the low interest rates, like I said, that's been propping up these stock markets. More so, I think it's easy to say than the uh, strong fundamental data. So, if we have a look back at the daily chart, we can see what we're dealing with here strong old rally that started to peter out and then we've had some talk in Europe and in China of uh, greater stimulus and we've kind of picked up on the rally again we're still going still well above the uh, the moving average but got a little bit closer to it you can see there we're kind of pulled closer to it and that was enough to uh, cause the next leg higher we're just correcting down now so in terms of US markets nothing too much to worry about at, uh, at this point If we have a look on the, the shorter term chart, again we can see where we were. This is the range. Failed a little bit here. Back down testing. But you could probably say that um, we're in a, in a kind of uptrending market while we're above this low here. But below there, we're kind of back into having made a high high, but then also a lower low. So more like a sideways market as we were in this little period here. Overall, obviously, a strong uptrend, but just in the short term. Um, if we should see some prices lower than here. So that kind of puts us more in a kind of sideways range with the next logical support being this um, high and then retested low from here. 
I mean, 18,000 is a big, it's, it's a big round number, and um, you know we could prod through it a bit further, but you can imagine in this general zone, it's a bit of an area to be cautious. Um, if we just look comparatively with the S and P, we can see that that the so I mentioned just now, the reaction really wasn't quite as positive in the S&P. We barely saw an intraday close beyond the the previous high from the 26th of November. Um, uh, we just, you know, we popped a bit higher, got just under that uh, 2,080 mark. I think we got to 79-ish. Yeah, 79.50 even, and now we've rolled off to the the second moving average. So you can see these moving averages are kind of chopping around in each other now, so it's not the kind of clean uptrend that we had for a while. It's losing a bit of momentum here. Prices dropped through both. I've got the um, 21 and 55 period moving averages, by the way, um, which just so happens in this particular trend, I think, can define the trend quite well. Um, these, you know, this was supported here, and then we've got that breakthrough. So that was a sign of concern that I highlighted, I believe, last week, or at least on the chart forum I did. And then here, you can see in the uh, the RSI, typically what I look for is um, the RSI to be kind of trading between either 40 and 70, uh, or 40 and just an overbought area, defining a bull market. But then when you slip below 40, um, after having this kind of bull market, uh, being in this bull zone, then that's a sh sign of potential weakness. And we may be even, you know, that's the first sign that perhaps we've moved into a bearish range, which would be below 60 down into the oversold area. So we haven't really made it above 60 yet. So it's a bit, you know, the RSI is, um, uh, you know, it's an early indicator. So it's not to say we can't make new highs first, but there are some signs that there's a real sticking point around this 2 a, um, 2018. Now, in the UK, we had a busy one last week. Um, so, for in terms of looking at the UK 100, we had a busy week last week, whereby we saw um, some good PMI data. That, despite the um, you know the problems in Europe, we're still seeing some good strength in 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 the UK and growth in the manufacturing and service sector. Um, but uh, we also had the um, Bank of England, and uh, they again kept rates steady um, at 0.5% uh, um, just because we're still seeing low levels of inflation uh, because of these lower oil prices and, uh, and wages have been low all year round and um, it looks like the Bank of England don't feel like any particular need to move higher on rates uh, while, while inflation and wages are still low despite the improving employment situation that we're seeing. So, in terms of the chart, you can see that this was the um, this is the area we've been banging into here. You can see it just so happened that this particular spike low was where we reacted to here. Could have been this one. I had that on the chart originally. You can see on a closing basis that's worked quite well, but we did see some pops higher. But generally, this was a kind of breakdown area here. Boom! That caused that massive ten percent odd sell-off. We're right back. We we're really kind of bumping into it in this particular candlestick. Um, within a kind of trading range like this, um, not necessarily of too much concern because it will just, you know, there was a big bullish engulfing candlestick. We bounced off the bottom of the breakout area. I highlighted this green area. We got up to the highs again, but now we're falling back to it. So it doesn't bode well, this candlestick. Definitely bearish, but, um, you know, we haven't closed the day yet, and we are still in this kind of sideways area. So it may end up just kind of pushing us towards the bottom of the range, only to go higher again. And you can see that was kind of the highlighted area that we got a bounce from, but only made it up to the previous high. And we've seen this kind of big sell-off today. Um, not necessarily UK-related, the, the sell-off today. We had some, some difficult data from, from Asia overnight, and um, not always necessary to, to know what happened in, in Asia, but on this particular occasion, um, we've seen even worse growth from uh, Japan than expected there in recession. 
and there's some political uncertainty over there just because uh, they've called snap elections to try and keep going this abenomics policy that um, has simultaneously um, pushed the dollar yen to seven year highs, um, pushed the Nikkei to the highest since 2007, not far off the highs made in 2000. Um, but nevertheless, uh, the Japanese economy is in recession. So, um, an interesting example of quantitative easing at play there. And uh, so that's um, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's troublesome for global growth. And equally, um, some data from China where the um, where we've seen a drop in imports again, largely because of the decline in oil prices. Just overall costs are down on the on the imports, but uh, exports. Um, is the major point of concern there. They've done a lot slower growth in exports just because there's a slowing global demand. And, um, you know, there isn't the demand out there for Chinese exports, and that's going to be troublesome for the Chinese economy. But, again, we're seeing uh, the Chinese index making 5-plus percent gains today, which you may think are slightly at odds to the uh, disappointing data. Yes, the data could be interpreted as positively because there's a bigger trade surplus um, and the lower oil prices could certainly be a uh, boon for the Chinese economy um, because they're net importers of oil. Um, but uh, I think it's the chance of further rate cuts in China which are, um, which are you know, the large explanation for this move. And, you know, so when you're trading these um, indices, You've got to kind of look at the uh, economic data, but in the current environment we, l we live in, it's really um, only, yeah, that fundamental data is really only so useful as how much it can tell you about the next round of stimulus coming. It it's really is about this um, uh, level of rate cuts, level of money printing, and how that affects the the each market involved. Let's so have a quick look at... Um, in terms of uh, an upcoming stimulus, let's uh, let's move on to the Germany 30. So this is what we can see. This is the general scheme of things. Um, had disappointing German data today. Um, slight, uh, still growth in industrial production, but not nearly as much as, as the previous month, and slightly below expectations. So we're seeing a bit of a pullback here, also related to this um, international data. And not altogether unsurprisingly, after the strong day we had on Friday, you can see that we've this, these were the prior all-time highs, and uh, we, you know, we pushed above those, and again, but we're above that 10,000 round number mark, which has proved a bit problematic since we first got there. But we've had a big kind of, um, you know, this candle engulfed the prior day in terms of its body. It's a strong candle, so we're seeing a slight pullback here, but you could expect maybe this candle's breakout area, or maybe you can see these two highs kind of fell in about the same area if we drop to a lower time frame. Um, something along the lines of here. And obviously corresponds with the uh, the 21 day moving average. Could be initial layer of support, then perhaps these lows here as the next layer. Um, so just think a pullback here again, similar to the um, the Dow Jones, nothing to be majorly concerned about. Potential buying opportunity on this dip. Um, it's only once we break the lows that we um, you know, should be more concerned. Yeah, um, okay, I'm, I'm getting a note from uh, from Andy that there's no sound. I'm seeing sound on my end. Andy, can you confirm is that um is that still the case? Obviously you're not gonna you're not gonna hear me saying that if you uh, don't have sound. I'm gonna send you a message. I, I, can anyone else confirm that they can um, can hear me okay?
Andy, it looks like it's your uh, your sound, my friend. Um, we've got some. Well, everyone else seems to be okay on the uh, on the sound front. <coughs> Okay, so moving swiftly on. Um, got a question from Richard here, just pertaining to um, the ending of QE and upcoming rising interest rate cycle. Well, it, this certainly that uh, rising interest rate cycle has, to, you know, has to come eventually, uh, Richard. But it's still, um, it's still sort of on the back burner. And um, it's not been sort of fully, fully priced in, if you like, because if you look at the, um, you know, the, the nature of the bond market that um, you're referring to, if we, let's have a look at. Uh, Actually, um, this is of note that in the last six months, um, you know, UK bonds actually have been some of the, uh, I believe, the best performing bonds in the G7. Um, so, you know, bond prices moving higher, that means yields moving lower. Um, so, in, in terms of the UK, um, they're really not pricing in a, um, you know, a rate hike too imminently. And um, it, again, it kind of goes back to this, um, you know. Bank of England are kind of focusing more on the lower oil prices and um, <coughs> uh, the, the problems in Europe and the risks that their minimal growth pose for the UK rather than the improving employment situation. Um, so, if, you know, for that reason, general consensus is out there is that we're probably not going to see a rate hike before this side of the general election and possibly not till the Final quarter of 2015, so we've still got a few months left of um, you know, of low interest rates, and then the the idea is that uh, the the pace of of rate hikes is going to be slower than normal, and the eventual destination will be lower than normal. You know that's what the um, the bank is projecting. Whether that's actually what turns out is you know, altogether, altogether a different perspective, but you know, based on the kind of low levels of inflation right now, they should, in theory, be able to to do that without overheating the economy. And so, you know, for that reason, there's there's not too much risk to gilts at the moment, but obviously, you know, eventually, should should rate should rates um, you know increase to a level that's kind of more historically normal you know that's when this um this rally in in bonds is start going it's going to start getting threatened but i think um you know up until that point you know we're still very much um you know we're still kind of trending higher now in the u s you know they do seem to be you know it's why we've seen um the british pound collapsing against uh, the u s dollar it's because the U.S. do seem to now be in a um, slightly faster stage of the, the slightly later stage of the, the rate hike cycle than the U.K. is. Namely, they're probably going to rate um, raise rates quicker in the U.S. at the Federal Reserve than they are in, in the U.K. and the Bank of England. Now. You can see T bonds, and then we've got the US 10 year here. Oh, I would need to close that one first. So, 
you know, there's not been so much movement in the U.S., and that, yeah, you know, that is reflective of the fact that they are just that much closer to um, hiking rates than, than we are in the U.K. We seem to be moving a little bit further away from it, if anything, at the moment. But nonetheless, um, the Fed is being uber cautious, and we're still trading in a kind of low yield, um, uh, low, you know, um, and high bond type environment. And when it comes to um, you know, kind of global markets at the moment, while these um, you know rates do remain low, there's just um, th there isn't the uh, there isn't the impetus to to look for for yield outside of the U.S. when you can have the relative safety of the, of the U.S. Another example in terms of the currency play space. If we look at dollar yen, this has been um, quite the quite the mad trend, and um, again, this sort of data seen today is not really doing much to undo the trend we're seeing here. And again, a, a, a talk about uh, you know different phases of the the rate hike cycle across the globe, and so JJBs are being almost exclusively bought up by the, the Japanese government at the moment and um, you know it's uh, the yen's being forced down and we're seeing the the dollar because of its own closeness and rate height cycle rallying higher and so that's why we're getting these um, near on seven year highs in, uh, in dollar yen and it's you know we'd, um, you'd imagine there's going to be some sort of resistance coming in from this kind of 124 area which was the the peaks made in 2007 but uh, there wasn't too much coming in at you know these peaks here, or even this breakdown area that I'd highlighted. Um, you know, we're sort of derp, dipping below it a little bit here. Maybe we won't get a close for, the but we got it. You know, we we did just about close the week above it. So we're in a kind of sell area here, technically, for the dollar yen. But still, the the fundamentals in terms of the cycle of interest rate hikes are certainly against it. I think it's important to note when you are trading these um, kind of short, extreme trends, you've got to just appreciate that um, the dips in this trend have been fairly minimal. You know, if you're looking for sort of almost a 200 pip dip, is has almost not happened in this in this whole rally. Um, you know, I think it's been sort of 150 pips has been almost almost the, the max you see in terms of a, a dip from one to the next, which is not a, a small amount, but still, given that how far this market's come. But if, you know, the higher it goes, obviously the greater the risk of a of a bigger pullback. But you know, if you keep expecting that larger pullback and it doesn't come, you, you you're missing out on these small dips each time. You know, we've um, we've come close to 122, saw some resistance there, but we're back at 121. You know, based on historical, you know, evidence. Here we hit 119. We dropped to, you know, 117.50 thereabouts. Found support there, so we've hit. You know, if we've hit 122, you'd expect prices based on these kind of evidence of these size dips, you know, not to go too much further below 120.50. Maybe that round figure one, uh, 120, but I'd be surprised if it even gets there. And then once we get into that 124 area, you know, then maybe that's when we start running into a bit more trouble. But uh, you know, the Jap Japan economy is in in recession, and uh, in the U.S. They're seeing plus 300,000 jobs growth, so it's definitely a different circumstance between the two. Um, I don't know if I fully addressed what you were after there on, uh, on, the, on the yields, Richard. Let me know if there's something else um, you're specifically looking into on that. I mean, I guess it really is. I mean, the, you know, the ultimate question for the bond market is just when does the, the bond market roll over? Um, but it's, I guess the question for now is it just doesn't look like it's happening just yet. Um, you know, at some point it's going to be a time to, to sell bonds, but there's still a good rally in bonds taking place at the moment. So I don't know if you want to fight that 
you know, um, if you do, you know, we know the, the, the fundamental scenario is that we need higher interest rates um, to, to threaten bond markets, and we're just not seeing those yet. And we're not seeing too much technical evidence of a, a rollover in the in the gilts or the German buns, you know, buns at the record low yields, um, Italian 10-year equivalents. Um, so drop below, I think, I believe it was a 10-year drop below 2% for the first time um, on record. So, you know, that still, um, even in more troubled European economies, um, there's still this move um, towards uh, buying bonds. And, you know, that's largely because there is still this ongoing threat out there of, um, uh, you know, of QE within Europe. Um, and in, in the UK and the US, they're still holding back on, on high income rates. So have a quick look at the euro here, since we did just mention. I think um, in terms of the euro the, and, and potentially European stock markets this week, the, the big event is going to be the, the, the results of the TL, TRO program. You know, what we basically heard in this latest ECB meeting was that um, uh, they were going to, you know, they obviously didn't do anything. In this meeting, what they're doing is they're, they're in wait and see mode to see how the current programs are playing out. And um, one of the programs is the ABS and covered bond purchases, so purchases of private assets. Um, that's not been making too much of a dent in the intended one trillion euro balance sheet that uh, the ECB wants to, to build towards. Um, so that's not looking too good so far, but they have said that that's you know mainly because it's the close to the start of the program and it's the year end. So you know that program st could still pick up. But the other program we want to look at um, is these uh, TLTROs. You know how after these uh, the bank stress tests that we saw in October, um, have the the banks now started to be a bit more aggressive in lending and making use of this program and lending out to the wider economy? If they are, uh, then there's some signs of this program working. And there may not be need for um, buying government bonds. If if there's signs that it's not working, well then the ECB is going to say, well, our current programs don't seem to be doing the job. You know, we need to step it up a notch to um, increase expectations of inflation and um, increase our balance sheet towards this target of one trillion. And uh, you know, that might be the point in which they start buying government bonds. But uh, so this uh, this week's results are going to give us a good clue about whether QE is happening, and that will give us a good clue as to whether yields deserve to be as low as they are in Europe, or um, whether the euro deserves to be as low as it is. But the trend's certainly down. You can see we just um, we held on to this declining trend line pretty well throughout with the euro. Never quite made it there on the last occasion. Just big fall off, almost dark cloud cover, on the, um, you know, just on a small correction, um, not really at the end of the trend, but still the, the pattern's kind of there and fell below the moving averages and, you know, we just kind of dipped below. And you've got to assume that probably, you don't have to assume, but it does seem like quite likely at the moment that we're heading towards this, um, you know, this 120, um, 40 level, which pretty much defined the, you know, the worst point of the European financial crisis. Um, we're not in a financial crisis in Europe necessarily this time around, so you know you might think that Draghi might be as equally concerned about the um, euro being this low this time around as he was last time, and you know come in and try and defend the euro. This time around, there isn't the threat of the euro falling apart. You know, last time, last time there was. Um, this is this is a euro falling um, purposely, you might say, because of uh, monetary policy. So this should act as some kind of interim support, I would imagine, um, but I can equally see prices continuing to move lower beyond that um, just because I don't see the central bank intervention coming in. If anything, it's, it's, it's coming in you know, to push prices even further lower. Skipped around a bit there, probably worth quickly mentioning, I'd put it on the, on the insights here, is that... Um, Brent crude prices uh, are making new multi-year lows. Let's just clean up Brent quickly.
There we are. That was the previous slide. So this 67.75, you saw got a bounce. Um, that we put out the chart a bit. You know that was based on this um, two longer term low f formed in um, in May of 2010, but got a bit of a bounce at the end of the week. But we're right back below below there. So still a solid downtrend in oil, and um, the new president of OPEC, um, lady from Nigeria, um, the oil minister of Nigeria, she um, yeah she's unlikely to be able to change policy. Um, OPEC uh, dominated by Saudi Arabia, and they want to let prices of oil fall until um, the shale producers in the U.S. got knocked out of business and overall supply drops, and hopefully in that same period of time, global demand eventually picks up and uh, supply demand dynamic will be more in favor of high prices. But for now, you know, the OPEC don't produce most of the world's oil anymore, and, um, you know, they have to sit back and bear it. Okay, um, unless there's any other questions, um, I think what I'm going to do is call it call it a day there. Thank you very much all for attending. I hope that was of some use. And um, I will uh, talk to you all at the... Uh, well, I guess one thing to note is I will, of course, see you at the same time next week, but we do have our analyst debates webinar in which I will be discussing uh, the nature of the markets with our Canadian colleague, uh, Colin Szynski, and uh, that will you know, be kind of wide-ranging discussion on all the various markets, and uh, it's certainly open to Q&A from, from all those who join. So um, sh should be some different perspectives um, on, on what's happening. And both of us are chartered market technicians, so for those who are interested in the um, charting and technical analysis and things, we can dig a bit deeper on that occasion. Okay, thank you. thanks again all. Have a great day and week's trading. Jasper Lawler signing off. Thank you. Bye.